This is a very basic shock absorber. What you see is what you get. And this is an adjustable rear shock off of my Yamaha R1. It has a weird tank on the back of it. Two different screws to fine tune how it behaves. Lots of threads to squish the spring to your heart's desire. A nut to alter its overall length. And it doesn't have to be thrown away if it starts leaking oil. It means business. So it's no wonder that basic shocks are the most common option and the fastest bikes come with adjustable shocks. So today we're going over the interesting differences between these two shocks. What makes each one good and bad and I think you've already seen how to spot the difference. Whether a shock is cheap or expensive, it has the same two jobs. Firstly, it has to support the rear weight of the bike and absorb any bumps you ride over. Secondly, it has to control its compression and rebound with damping. And all shocks achieve this with the same basic construction. First of all, there's a spring. But a spring would just go up and down uncontrollably without damping. So in the middle of the spring is a cylinder filled with oil and a piston on a rod that gets forced up and down inside the cylinder. That piston then has a series of holes and shims that restrict how quickly oil can flow through it, in turn controlling how quickly the shock can compress and rebound. But of course, just like everything in life, the basic principle gets innovated over time as engineers push it to its limits and you end up with a shock that looks more like this. Now both of these shocks are mono shocks, meaning they're intended to do all the rear suspension work on their own. There was a time when motorcycles would have two shocks, one on each side of the bike. But thankfully, technology has advanced to the point where one shock can do the job better, neater and lighter. Some manufacturers like Harley-Davidson still use twin shocks from time to time for aesthetic reasons. But this results in the swing arm repeatedly twisting, wobbling the rear wheel through long corners as each shock behaves slightly differently. And yes, it is as unpleasant as it sounds. Notice how I didn't even make a joke about Harley being allergic to innovation. Crap, I guess that counts. However, the most obvious difference between the basic shock and the adjustable shock is this weird tank attached to it. It's called a remote reservoir, an external reservoir, or a piggyback reservoir, whichever you prefer. When a shock compresses, more of the shaft enters the cylinder, displacing some oil. And that oil has to go somewhere. So nitrogen gas is used within the shock in addition to oil, since a gas can be compressed, whereas oil cannot. So when the shaft displaces oil, the gas is compressed to make extra space. And this can be done in a few different ways. It can be done by simply mixing oil and nitrogen in one cylinder. It can be done in the same cylinder, but with a piston separating the oil from the nitrogen. It can be done with a twin tube design, a sort of tube within a tube separating the oil and nitrogen, or with an external reservoir either with a piston or a bladder approach. Obviously mixing oil and nitrogen together, like this very cheap shock does, is a bad idea. So separating it is a must. But being able to do that in just one cylinder takes up volume from the oil and piston. So having an external reservoir on a shock gives the piston more travel as well as more oil capacity since it's not taking up space within the main body while still managing to be a relatively compact finished product. Another benefit of an external reservoir is that the more oil you have, the longer it'll take to heat up. And storing some of that oil in a separate cylinder will help to cool it down. And the shock will always work more consistently if you keep the oil temperature consistent. The next obvious difference is these compression and rebound clickers. Turning these clickers controls the oil flow for when the shock compresses and rebounds independently, and in turn controls how quickly the shock can move in each direction. Whereas the basic shock is set up when it's built, and there's no way to change that. If a shock compresses too slowly over a bump, for example, it could then be too rigid and kick the wheel up off of the ground, decreasing traction. The same way as if a shock rebounds too slowly, it might still be compressed by the time you hit the next bump. And if a shock is too deep in its stroke when it hits a bump, it won't be able to do its job effectively, 
not to mention it changes the geometry of the bike. So being able to fine tune these speeds for your type of riding can really improve traction and handling. The next adjustment on offer are these rings above the spring that allow you to compress it, putting more or less tension on it, and this is called preload. Both of these shocks do technically offer preload adjustment, but some very basic shocks won't even let you do that. Or for example, an MT-07 shock will let you adjust the preload, but the gaps between each setting are pretty big, so you won't be able to fine tune it as much as with a threaded approach like this. Typically, you would just adjust the preload to get the perfect sag for your weight. But the beauty about an adjustable shock is that you would also be able to buy a spring with the specific spring rate for your riding style and weight so that the shock can work better for you specifically. Ideally, you want the shock to compress a certain amount even when you just sit on the bike so that the shock has some room in each direction to compress and rebound over bumps. A less common adjustment is this nut on the bottom of the adjustable shock. This will let you wind the rod in or out altering the overall height of the shock and therefore affecting your rear ride height. This will affect the stability and handling of your bike, but if you aren't very serious about track riding, this probably isn't super important. Hence why it's not even an option on the basic shock. Interestingly, the adjustable shock has more functionality and is physically bigger, but yet it weighs slightly less which just shows you how much better the materials are on the adjustable shock. Another very important difference in my opinion is serviceability. If you look closely at the adjustable shock, you'll notice that the spring can be removed, the oil can be drained, the clickers can be removed, and the whole thing can be disassembled. Whereas if you look at the basic shock, the only thing that can be removed is the spring. So if the adjustable shock starts leaking, you can replace seals. You could refresh the oil every few years, or open it up to revalve it. But if the basic shock starts leaking, you have to throw it away and buy a whole new one. There's not even a way to get the oil out of it without completely destroying it. This is why you'll only find adjustable shocks on sporty bikes and premium bikes. They cost more to produce, but they offer a lot more benefits. And this is just the stock shock. Aftermarket options take it to a whole new level, but I'll get into that in the next video. And of course, those are just the basics. There is a lot more to shocks if you want to get serious about suspension. But anyway, that is why the adjustable shock looks cooler, works better, and costs more. Let me know what adjustment your shock has and if you've ever played with it, and I'll see you on the next ride.